Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Join us on Main Street, Wyoming, as we explore two impactful architectural projects in the Tetons. One that was built and one that was not. It is an idea, but look at the, the strength of that idea. Gilbert Stanley Underwood and Mies van der Rohe brought bold ideas of modernism and international style architecture to Wyoming. There's a lot that lends itself to this landscape and to this location and really makes this building interesting. Production funding for Main Street, Wyoming is provided in part by the Wheeler Family Foundation of Casper and by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you. In 1929, my grandfather, Stanley Rezor, came out here with his friend, Jack Heiler. He was about 12, to spend a summer in Jackson Hole. At the request of his parents, he called home every Sunday from a payphone in town. And a couple weeks in, he told his father, this place is really great, we should come out here. So his father, being a very trusting uh, man of his young son's judgment, bought a couple hundred acres sight unseen. And that was the beginning of the Snake River Ranch. In 1931, they started building more cabins on the ranch. And at the time, the cabin fronted on a road that came from the main road in town, which meant every time someone drove through, you got a nice dust cloud. So Helen began thinking about reorienting the living area away from the road. And in a couple of years, she decided to do this with a new dining room cabin that would be over what we call the mill stream, which comes off the Snake River. In the meantime, she had built another cabin, the white cabin where we are now, that was designed by Goodwin, who was, ended up being one of the architects of the Museum of Modern Art. And she decided to stick with Goodwin for the beginning of the dining room project. But due to some disagreements, she decided to stop using Goodwin, put the whole project on hold. So in 1936, they had a partially built cabin, needed a new architect, and Alfred Barr, Helen's good art shopping friend, wanted Mies van der Rohe to come to America to come contribute his skills and knowledge to American architecture. Mies van der Rohe, one of the most prolific architects of the 20th century, was known for his architecture, his furniture design, and as an educator. Mies was already doing significant work in the early 20s. He is sort of known as the father of the glass skyscraper. So in addition to his work in exploring the idea of vertical buildings, um, he also was an educator. He was the head, the director of the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus was a center of arts education in Germany between the wars. And many of the people that are big names in 20th century art and design were part of the Bauhaus. Mies van der Rohe was the director from the late 20s till 1933 when the Bauhaus ceased to exist and Germany started to hit some rough water. Mies van der Rohe also practiced architecture at many different scales. One of the most creative projects that Mies van der Rohe did was the Barcelona Pavilion for the International Exposition in Barcelona in 1929. In this case, this pavilion was an opportunity for him to explore architecture as free expression. So there was a lot of exciting design activity going on in Europe between the wars. Um, there was the Bauhaus, there was um, Russian constructivism. All of them were the results of the Industrial Revolution and of changing cultural considerations and questioning of, cons of considerations of new um, technological uh, and construction methodology. All of those things converged to call for a new kind of work a kind of work that really didn't 
repeat what had been repeated for, um, for hundreds of years. The modern idea was really new and it really looked for a kind of essential truth that was would be internationally accepted, hence the name international style, but it looked to present new meaning in architecture that was based on the spirit of that age. Technology really created the ability to allow the diminishing of the solidity of the wall of a structure. So the definition of space entirely changed. When a building went from the walls actually being thick and holding up what is above them to a series of sticks which uh, brought all of the loads down to points. The space in between could then be glass, it could be transparent. This was a, a revolutionary thing in architecture in the early 20th century. Mies van der Rohe really seized the moment to explore these things. So Helen, knowing this, wrote to him to see if he was interested in coming out west, as she said, to build a cabin. I think Alfred Barr built up the project a little bit more than Helen had. He underemphasized the challenging location that he was proposing and spoke of the beauty of the mountains and the wonders of the American West and how different they were from Europe. And this was enough to get Mies van der Rohe interested and come to a meeting in Paris with Helen. And despite a language barrier, they hit it off. She really liked him and decided to try to get him to come for six weeks to the United States to see the site and come up with a proposal for the house. That meeting was in July. By August, they were on a boat, America bound, and they came out to Wyoming. And he spent six weeks getting to know the site, which he initially hated, partially because there was the pre-started building by Goodwin, which he didn't approve of, and partially because he found the location unideal, being built over a river. But after a couple days and seeing the dust of the other locations, he began to understand why it was actually ideal to have it over water. So he was sold and he agreed to stay in the US and make up some plans for a house. However, things were not so simple. And by the time he was leaving in March of the following year, my great grandfather, Stanley Rezor Sr., who let his wife handle the artistic side of things, but definitely was in charge of the money side, uh, he decided that the project was getting way out of budget and told Mies it wasn't canceled, but he would put it on hold until Mies could return to the United States and oversee it. Uh, part of the problem with this early design was that it had two stories and a lot of glass walls, basically. So these price and logistical challenges seemed to be a sign at least to my great-grandfather, that Mies was not so comfortable with the American situation of building and wanted him to come back, work with American architects, and make it more reasonable. Mies did come back in September that year and continued the project, and he simplified it to the version that we now know, which is a single level, rather more iconic Mies and very minimalist. However, in the ensuing years, with America entering the Second World War, freight issues continued to be a problem, specifically because Mies wanted to use a Louisiana swamp cypress to clad the exterior of the building. In his mind, this was a relatively local material because it came from America. However, when all American freight was put into the war effort, it was not local or really accessible to Wyoming at all. The final nail in the coffin, I guess, for the project was a flood in the spring of 1943. And the tributary that the house was situated over comes off of the Snake River. We received a early morning, about 3 a.m. call from the Snake River Dam uh, up at Jackson Lake saying that the dam was too high, the snow melt was unprecedented, and they were going to have to release the dam. So it was basically a grab your stuff and get out of the way call. And the river flooded. And the tributary, the mill stream, completely flooded a footbridge that was downstream from the building, knocked over and redirected a lot of the water at two of the cement pylons, which brought them down, which brought the building down. So it was an incredible flood, and it just seemed to be the final indication that this building was not meant to be built. 
So all that remains now are two cement pylons and the lore of Mies van der Rohe in Jackson Hole. Let's have a little discussion about how modern architecture moved from Germany to the U.S. by way of Jackson, Wyoming, one of the most remote, furthest of spots from New York City or Chicago, where the, mo where the movement kind of got its impetus in the States. Go ahead, Stephen. What do you well, think? Well, I think it's compelling that, that a place of this sparsity would be an introduction. First of all, you know, here, when I began my practice in Wyoming 20 plus years ago, you know, this was 60 plus years since the design or the, the whole episode of this building. And there were still discussions as there are today about tradition versus modern, you know? And when I think of the, the struggle to get the point across that modern work can connect to the landscape, really empowered the idea that modern work had some kind of history in this environment. Looking at those early diagrams and particularly the collages that Mies makes, I think that it's incredible that in some ways that building is one of the most responsive to the natural architecture around it. He really lets the mountains come right in and there's so little else to compete with them. And that's forever an image that I associate with Jackson Hole and the Tetons. Uh, one that I think really explains how architecture is not in competition with nature and sort of at the same time raises the bar to what architecture should be in a setting this beautiful. There's an interesting aspect of, um, in, history, in the history of architecture, the effect and the impact of unbuilt projects, that is maybe it's just the power of an idea, is so amazing. This, we're discussing a building that was never built. It is an idea, right? But look at the, you know, the strength of that idea. And you know, when you look at many unbuilt projects in the history of architecture that are celebrated as having been groundbreaking um, you know, and never built, this is sort of one of them. It's really very unique that what's essentially an architectural drawing has been elevated to the level of being considered a piece of artwork in and of itself that some people know better than they actually know the house. And I think that really comes from this Bauhaus idea that architecture is sort of the sum of all the other parts of art put together for, you know, the complete masterpiece. One thing to really think about would be, what happens if this built was that building was actually built? And what happens if it withstood the flood? Then we could really criticize it. Then we could <laughs> criticize it, but the Lord yeah, wouldn't it, be it, there. It, but it at the be, same it time, be perfect. Well, I, right. you know, this is an, a, a great question because if that building had been built, would it have given Jackson Hole a different history moving down the road? You know, I mean, the idea was strong enough, you know, but, but it wasn't present. Modern work is accepted normally through example. So if you are positing something, you know, about modern architecture and it's built, you then make it easier. So I love stories of art like this, you know, that, that remind, I mean, I could just imagine that building if it were built, you know, like bringing a, a richness to people's lives, a new way to look at how you occupy space, how you relate to the landscape. You know, if it were built, there, there would have to be results of that. There would have to be an impact on the culture. After World War II, a lot of people were coming to national parks. They were so happy that rationing was over and the soldiers were home and wanted to see their country. And the parks really were not equipped for meeting the hordes of people who were coming. And so Mission 66 was devised that by 1966, there would be safe and adequate facilities for the great numbers of people who were coming. Jackson Lake Lodge was really a precursor to the Mission 66 program, which began in 1956, so a year after Jackson Lake Lodge opened. Mission 66, as, as Mary pointed out, was meant to modernize the national parks. Jackson Lake Lodge being right before that, um, it really ties in with those past lodges and that it's a lodge with these outskirt cabins. So I think in that sense, Jackson Lake Lodge is really 
the last great rustic lodge, but it also is a bridge into what was to come in Mission 66. The Rockefellers were willing to finance the building of Jackson Lake Lodge, but they couldn't think in terms of financing all the buildings, and they wondered would it be possible for private money to build hotels and get their money back charging reasonable rents. They wanted to make it so that the American public could afford to stay. Their idea of reasonable wasn't what the tin can tourists thought was reasonable, but it did become possible for some of the middle class people to use this. Uh, you know, I think people thought that Rockefeller was crazy to build a lodge that was only open three months out of the year. There was no way that was going to be financially viable. And he was insistent that it was a gift to the American public. And it was really the capstone of his big projects here in the Teton area. He purchased so much land that he donated to the Park Service and preserved. And Harold Fabian, his lawyer, recalls in an oral history interview saying something like, well, we've saved this park, now we have to give the people somewhere to stay. And Rockefeller said, you're right, and the next day things started happening. I'm sure it wasn't that quick, but I, I think that there's some good story there about, you know, that when he started working, when Rockefeller started uh, purchasing land and you know, showing interest in, in the Jackson Hole Valley, that uh, he didn't intend to build a grand lodge. Uh, that was really something that came out of his preservation work. So in the previous project that we discussed, the Reeser Ranch by Mies van der Rohe, we had um, early modernism about 20 something years before this building was done. The Jackson Lake Lodge is really a kind of populist version of modernism. It's a little bit softer in that it incorporates aspects of the arts and crafts nature of the earlier national park buildings but it is still a modern building. It has a very linear influence. Some of it could be called a bit of prairie style of the architect Frank Lloyd Wright, but this architect, Gilbert Stanley Underwood, was able to incorporate aspects of traditional work along with these new modern ideas. Jackson Lake Lodge was designed really to take the most advantage of the site without intruding on the site. And I think that's the key to looking at the design, is that the mountains behind it are very tall and jagged, but the site we're actually on is very flat. We're on a bench above Willow Flats here, and the site is, I think he described it as billiard table flat. And so the building and these blocks are long horizontals, and the building's supposed to sink into that landscape so that it's not part of the landscape. One of the remarkable things about this building is the approach, the way it lives in the landscape. When you approach the building from getting out of a car, you're in a really dense landscape. The building is almost entirely obscured, and as you approach, the story unfolds of what this building and this entry sequence is about. The Port Cochere is a very low space, and it sets up the contrast as we walk through this building, the building is a kind of filter from the east side, which is one aspect of nature. It's cooler, it's tree covered, and we will see as it unfolds the impact of the other side of the building. When you approach the building, uh, you don't see it because of all the landscaping, and that was very intentional. Um, when you look at the building from the other side, say over from the dam, you don't see the building either because it just is part of this bench. Now we're in the entry vestibule of the hotel. This is a bit of a holding area before you rise up to the grand lounge space that we will proceed to. In this idea of a sequence of entry, as an architect practicing in this environment, I can't overstress the importance of the lesson of what this presents, how you enter a building, how you reveal nature. The stairs that Underwood designed, he designed with purpose of forethought. His mode of operation was when possible, he would bring people into a rather unprepossessing area such as our lower lobby filled with offices and desks and that sort of thing and then he would lead people up 
and they went up this narrow staircase, and my goodness, at the top of the staircase, they burst into a magnificent view of this upper lobby and through the windows of the mountains. His idea of letting people be surprised in that way was not much understood. As a matter of fact, the employees called that stairway the cattle chute because of people funneling up and down it. But about two years after the lodge was built, they had a big redesign and made the wider staircase. And people are still delighted when they get to the top, but Underwood's original idea isn't there anymore. The architect that had designed this building really did thoroughly think about it from every aspect. He planted the parking lot so that it eventually would be tree covered and diminish and obscure the approach to the building. He left the west side very visible, but he also gave glimpses of the building and I think thought through very carefully so many aspects of this and took so seriously the intentions of the Rockefellers in making this building respect the landscape. The building was designed just as a place for people to stay in the national park so that they could go out and experience Grand Teton National Park, um, whether through fishing or rafting. And the lodge company did lead raft trips and, and horseback rides and ways for people to get out into the national park. There were no TVs in the rooms. There's still no TVs in the rooms here because you're not supposed to be staying in the rooms. You're supposed to be going out and experiencing the park, whether you're out actually in the wilderness or you're in the main lobby looking at the view. So now we are in the main lounge of the hotel. This space is not unlike some of the really grand hotels of the former century and even currently where they are big living rooms for the space. They have seating groups, they can accommodate the intimacy of two people or 20 people and together it makes for a nicely bustling public space. The walls have stone cladding on it and the building being concrete again the stone is used in certain areas where the human interface with it is fairly close above we have trusses which though appear to be wood are in fact steel encased in concrete this again went toward the desire for national park architecture to be fireproof this is a high fire zone and it assures that the building will be here a long time. And then I love his other thing, which is so prominent in the lodge, and that is his use of what he called shadow wood. He took a sheet of plywood and he wire brushed it so that it would have deeper grain. And then he built a form and poured concrete against that plywood. And when it set up, he pulled the plywood off. And here you have this uh, grain appearance and then in in this lodge he used acid stained brown to make it look like wood. This room is also the center of circulation. The things that open onto this room include the conference center to the north, there is a west side dining room called the mural room that has views of the Tetons and then there is an east facing restaurant called the Pioneer Grill, which is really modeled after the diners of the 50s. This is a room that has peninsula seating, that has the feel and materials of mid 20th century diners, and really did address the issues of two places to eat if you were getting a quick meal versus you wanted to have a real sit-down dinner. It offered a broader price range. It was fairly economical, and it went along with the mission of the building, which was to make it accessible. When the lodge opened, there was a horrible reaction to it. People, people thought it did not fit in the National Park. They didn't know why Underwood had designed this uh, for Grand Teton, and they just didn't think it was appropriate. These buildings take a while for people to warm up to them. I think there probably are still people that wouldn't choose this kind of architecture, would do a more traditional building. But 
I want to reinforce the importance to architecture as a discipline and to our culture in general about options and choices and about the relationship of a building with the time in which it's created. And I'm not talking about buildings that are trendy. I'm talking about buildings that work with and consider methods of construction and other real considerations of site and program. What's happening in the building? How are people going to use it? And, and work with progressive ideas. Ethan Card talks a lot in his book on Mission 66 about how the Park Service has always had the same goal in designing in the wilderness or in national parks, and that is to design uh, buildings that harmonize with the landscape. But what really changes between the 1920s and the 1950s is what we mean by harmonize. And in the 1920s, we're looking at buildings that help frame the view and are part of the landscape. And those beautiful rustic buildings with their natural materials do just that. It's a lot like taking a photo out at Mormon Row or something where you have the building in your frame. Here at Jackson Lake Lodge, the building wasn't supposed to be part of your view. It was just supposed to be really a means to an end to experience the national park and the view here. There was this wonderful urban legend that John D. Rockefeller Jr. had had scaffolding erected in front of where the big window would be in Jackson Lake Lodge because he had been so taken with the view from Lunch Tree Hill that he wanted to be sure that we, the public, would be able to have exactly the same view of those mountains that he had enjoyed from right up the hill beside the lodge. I was in the Rockefeller archives, was looking at Martha Baird Rockefeller's photo album, and came to this photo of people standing on a scaffolding pointing at the mountains and the people were Gibber Stanley Underwood, the architect, and John D. Rockefeller Jr., and Martha Baird Rockefeller, and other dignitaries that had to do with the building of Jackson Lake Lodge. And it had to be that that little story was true. But I think that proves how much he was interested. No building is perfect, and there are things that are certainly not perfect about the building, but it is an important building in this region, and it's an important building to the national treasure of buildings. Lessons like the unfolding sequence of entering is an experiential thing that is something that I revisit in many projects. The materiality of the building, the impression of wood on concrete is something that I return to in expressing what buildings are made out of. There's a lot that lends itself to this landscape and to this location and I, I think it's more about understanding the, the 1950s and uh, the changes going on in the United States and in national parks that uh, really makes this building interesting. I do have a strong feeling that the integrity of this building makes it interesting when it was built and going forward into the future because it is more functional than something that was created at that time to mimic something that was created before it. Production funding for Main Street, Wyoming is provided in part by the Wheeler Family Foundation of Casper and by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you.